You know, there's a big difference between knowing about God and about His presence and being currently aware of God's presence in your life, right? You, you can academically, biblically, you, you can know a lot about God's presence. You could, you could answer all kinds of questions. You could maybe teach a seminar on it, maybe a whole conference about God's presence. But there's a huge difference between knowing and being aware, being aware of God's presence in your life on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to really know what's going on and to really think about God, God with us, God in our lives. You know, if we were intentional in a way that was constantly thinking, God's here with me. God's, as a follower of Christ, in me, His Spirit dwelling in me. If we were to constantly think about God and His presence in Him with us, if we were mindful of His presence, I really think we'd be more likely to live and act according to God's Word. I mean, put yourself in some different scenarios in life, right? When we're mindful of God's presence, we're more likely to respond to anxiety with prayer. Anxious moment comes, right? Your mind can be going in a million different directions. You can get all worked up. You can be all whatever. But if you are mindful of God's presence, we respond to anxiety with prayer. When we're mindful of God's presence, we, we live by faith. And we don't live in fear. When we're mindful of God's presence, we're more likely to be bold for our faith than to, than to be silent when opportunity arises. And when we're mindful of God's presence, God's glory is revealed through us. This morning we're going to look at a passage from the book of Exodus in the life of Moses. We're going to keep going through this study that, that opens our hearts and, and our minds, that's, that's the prayer this morning, to the wonder of God's presence and God's glory. And with that in mind, let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and just commit our time to Him. God, we come before You, and as we dive into Your Word this morning, help us to be mindful of Your presence, even right here, right now in this room. Our minds can run in, in a thousand different directions. But we're asking and praying that you would help us to be mindful of you in this moment. Not those who are around us. Not those that aren't here. But help us to be mindful of you in your presence, in your word, in your glory. So God, we're asking for your blessing as we really try to talk about a subject that, that can be difficult to understand, difficult to even communicate. Lord, we pray that your spirit and your word would do a great work in our hearts and our lives and our minds today to be mindful of you and your presence, your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we looked at Exodus 32, if you were with us, and uh, if you weren't, we talked about the, the, the golden calf, and really the story of the golden calf was all about how Israel forgot about God. They forgot about all the signs and wonders, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea that they had walked through, even, there was even though there was walls of water on each side of them. And we talked about the importance of being diligent to remember. And it's important to be diligent to remember because forgetfulness can lead to sinfulness. That's exactly what happened with the nation of Israel. They forgot and their, sin, their forgetfulness led to sinfulness. We need to be diligent to remember. Well, this morning we're going to be in Exodus 33. It's on page 42 if you're using the Bibles around you there. And uh, in the beginning of chapter 3, God's kind of going to tell, tell Moses, he's like, all right, you know, it's time to pick up and go. 
They had this, this episode with the golden calf and all that took place there, but it's time to keep moving. It's time to head towards uh, the, the promised land. And so it says this in Exodus chapter 33 in verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. And then he tells him this, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Don't miss that last part, right? God's like, listen, you go up. You go up and and you go. Moses, lead them there. I'm going to send an angel, and and I'm going to do an incredible work. Uh, in terms of taking out your enemies, but I'm not going to go up among you lest I consume you on the way for you're a stiff-necked people. God, God's had enough. And, and the sin of, verse, or of chapter 32 was an issue, a major issue. And once again, this points to the seriousness of sin even in our, in our own lives. And when we don't deal with sin, and if, if we don't, Uh, Deal with it in our own lives. It brings separation. Separation from God. Goes on in verse 4. It says this, When the people heard this disastrous word that God's not going with them, when they heard this disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. It's really interesting to think about this. If even for a moment I'm with you, you're gone. You're toast. Can't even be around you. It's interesting to note here how the mourning of the people and their sin led to them removing these ornaments, not just for a time being, but notice it says in the end of verse 6 there, from Mount Horeb onward. Listen to what New American Commentary says about this idea of of mourning in in the ornaments, the jewelry. In the ancient Near East, mourning tended to involve appearance, not just attitude. Think about if you've read through the Bible, sackcloth and ashes, right? It It wasn't just about attitude, it was about appearance. So that what one wore was a part of the appearance aspect of mourning. Nothing fancy could adorn a mourner because fancy dress was associated with cheerfulness and might contradict the desired behavior of mourning. Therefore, they removed all the adornment and made their appearance plain as a sign of mourning. I think it's really interesting to think about this. They wanted even their appearance to help guide them to the reality that they needed to mourn their sin. And it was a huge deal. You know, I, I've sat with numerous, numerous individuals over my years of ministry and um, had people that wanted to sit and talk with me just about areas of sin in their life that they're dealing with. And, and I can tell you, there's, there's count, countless situations um, where, where, where I've had these conversations. And, and I will say this, not all the time, but most of the time, when someone comes to me who really seems to get a handle uh, 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 on the sin that's in their life, they're individuals who come and they mourn their sin. They're grieved over their sin. I mean, if somebody comes in and they want to talk to me about it and they're not broken over their sin, that's generally a red flag for me. But when somebody comes in and they want to sit down and talk about it and they're broken, I've had... Many grown men sit in my office in tears over their sin. Honestly, it's one of the greatest things I can see in that moment is a man that's broken over his sin. Listen, we need to be wrecked over our sin. It ought to wreck us. Why? Because of what it does in our lives and in our relationship with God and in our relationship with the body of Christ. In this situation here, it clearly got their attention to the point where they said, you know what, we need to remove anything that might even communicate cheerfulness. James talks about the idea of being wrecked over our sin. He says this, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse 
your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Get rid of the sin. And then he says this, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That's what happens when somebody's serious about dealing with sin. Because sin brings separation from God, from others, and if we don't deal with it, it causes major problems. Well, looking back at, at this passage in Exodus, and God saying He wasn't going to go with them, you know, I'm not sure we can fully understand the magnitude of God saying, I'm not going with you. I mean, we, we try to wrap our minds around this, but for those of us who are followers of Christ, Upon salvation, we're granted the gift of God's Spirit who indwells within us. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, the resident of God's, the residence of God's Spirit. And as we go through life, we're blessed with the continual presence of God in the form of His Spirit within our lives. And in a sense, once we come to Christ, I don't know that we can really grasp what's going on here. See, when God says here, uh, he's no longer going to be with them, this was a disastrous word, it says in verse 4, to the people of Israel. That word disastrous has the idea of causing great damage. Great damage. It, it was something terrible, something, something troubling and, and harsh and awful. And that's what our sin does. And the reality was, for the people of Israel, God's presence was not going to be there with them. Gone. And when we think about God's presence, I think so often we take it for granted. I do. I know I do. I wish I was more mindful of God's presence. Well, Moses goes on in the next few verses, he's going to kind of explain. This is kind of what took place in terms of God's presence with the people in the camp. And he kind of gives us a picture here. It says, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. Now, if you can imagine this, right? Over a million people, right? Maybe closer to two million people. And everybody stands outside. They stand at the door of their tent, and, and they're watching Moses. They're watching when he goes into the tent. Verse 9, And when Moses entered the tent... The pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Think about that for a second, right? They were very mindful of God's presence in a very different way than we are. When Moses goes into the tent of meeting and he's going to be with the Lord, all of the people go to the door of their tent and they watch. And the second he goes in to meet with the Lord, they respond with worship. Why? Because they're mindful of God's presence. They're very aware of God's presence. And they knew visibly when it wasn't there. Thus, verse 11, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. As a man speaks to his friend, and when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses gives us this idea of what it was like and what God's presence was like with the people of Israel. And now you have this conversation that takes place with the Lord. It says this in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Like, who, who's going? Is everybody going? These people sinned. Are, are some of them not going? I know some died of the plague, and some we, we, we killed by the sword. Who's going? Yet you have not said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Verse 13, now therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. He's not worried about the people so much as he is about finding favor in God's sight and knowing God's ways. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And really what 
Moses is doing is he's pleading with God to understand all that's going on and all that's taking place and how in the world are they supposed to move forward and we got this huge issue. What do we do, God? How are we going to do this if your presence isn't with us? How, how am I going to know all the things, Lord? Verse 14, this is the Lord responding. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Whew. And Moses said, verse 15 to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses doesn't want to go anywhere without God's presence. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. Moses brings up a crucial point that we really need to grab a hold of here. The thing that distinguishes God's people is God's presence. Catch that. Very true here in the Old Testament. Moses is saying, listen, if we're going to go, if you're not coming with us, we're not going anywhere. Because what makes us different from everybody else, God, is you. It's not us. It's you. It's your presence. You're the one that's performed the miracles. You're the one that's done all these great things. You're the one who's the cloud by day, the, the pillar of fire by night. It's all happening by you. You're the one who's given us the manna, the water to drink from the rock. It's all you, God. And if you're not going with us, I'm not going anywhere. Probably one of the smarter things Moses ever said, right? You know, the same is true for us today when you think about God's presence. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the thing that makes you different is God with us. I mean, that's what Christmas is all about. I just kind of wanted to use my, my Grinch voice there. That's what Christmas is all about. Anyways, I'm sorry. What happens when you got six kids and 19 years of kid movies? But isn't it true? Christmas is all about Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the difference. And, and if we're followers of Christ, upon salvation, His Spirit indwells us. And people ought to recognize, hey, there's really something different about that guy, about that lady, about that kid. I don't know what it is, but there's something really different about them. And it ought to be that God is in us and that God shines through us. The difference is God's presence. This is why Jesus said, John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the difference of being in Christ, of being a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Christ, I'm sorry, but it's like you're walking around in the dark with the lights off, okay? And when you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's like the light switch is flipped on, and you see life in a whole new way. Really, it's like you're blind, okay? It really is. You're like, that sounds a little extreme. No, it's not extreme at all. And if you don't get it, my guess is you don't get Jesus Christ. He makes it really clear. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's also why he told his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, you, he said, are the light of the world. Why? Because as followers of Christ, his spirit was, is within us. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The light that is in us is the light of Jesus Christ, and the light that shines through us to others is Christ, is God's Spirit within us. And when we allow Christ to shine through us, it points others to the Savior and it brings glory to our Father who's in heaven. The point is this. God's people are known by God's presence. We're set apart by God's presence. In the Old Testament, that was God's relationship with Israel. 
And Moses knew that. He knew that the difference in everything was God's presence. He knew this personally, didn't he? Remember how Moses felt unqualified, right? (laughs) God, listen, Uh, I'm not the guy, right? Moses knew that it had nothing to do with his abilities by this point, but it was all about God and God's presence and God working in him and through him. He thought he was incapable, and in all reality he was, but with God's presence, with God in his life, he was able to do incredible things. But now Moses, he's been in God's presence, and he's now about to request a glimpse into the awe and wonder of God's impeccable glory. And it says this, verse 17, The Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, but he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And, and while my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This passage in some ways is kind of mind-boggling. And, and, it, and it ought to be. It ought to, we ought to take a look at this and say, you know what, I, I'm not sure I can really comprehend everything that's going on in this passage. I'm not sure we can. I'm not sure we can fully wrap our minds around God's glory and all of God's goodness passing before Moses. In fact, I, I got to tell you, when I was studying through this, I got to this part and I just struggled to even know what to, what to say, what to tell you, because I feel like, in a sense, that anything that's said is almost inadequate to really fully comprehend what's going on here in this moment. Moses has this incredible experience. Where all, goods, all of God's goodness passes before him, where God proclaims his covenant name before Moses, and God grants Moses the opportunity to even just get a glimpse of his back. And I say, well, what makes all that so special? God's glory, God's presence. We know this from what we see in chapter 34. In chapter 34, Moses. Again, he receives the Ten Commandments for the second time. The covenant's renewed, and God's presence passes before Moses. And when God's presence passes before Moses, I want you to hear what Moses' response is in verse 8 of chapter 34. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. The second Moses gets this glimpse, he recognizes he has no business being before God. He quickly bows his head to the earth. He worshiped and he said, if now I found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us for it's a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. See, if, if we could visibly behold our God, we would be undone. That's Moses here throws himself on the ground and worships God and pleads for God's presence and forgiveness of sin. If you read through the Bible, you can see other times where individuals encounter God. A great example is Isaiah 6, when Isaiah has this vision of the Lord on his throne and he responds in Isaiah 6, 5 with this, Woe is me, for I am lost. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's the response of God's presence. That's the response. And if we would only be aware of God's presence, we would behave so, 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 so much differently. We would act so differently. Lord, help us to be aware of your presence. Moses is undone. Isaiah's undone. Verse 29 says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. It was visible. And Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. God's presence. God's glory. And it was visible that Moses had been with God. I encourage you to read in the, in the book of Acts, early in the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 4, verse 13, it talks about how the, the people recognized that these uneducated men who were called disciples had been with Jesus. Moses comes down and his face is glowing, right? You think of a glowing face, maybe you think of of a woman being pregnant, but I'm sorry, ladies, I don't think any ever glowed quite like Moses did here. So much so that people are afraid to even come near him. Verse 31, but Moses called them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. puts a cloth over it. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. God's presence and God's glory. Deuteronomy 34 tells us this about Moses is that there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. As I already mentioned, I'm not sure we can begin to imagine what Moses experienced, and yet, it, it ought to challenge us. If Moses was glowing after being in God's presence, Shouldn't there be a glow about us as followers of Christ? That others can visibly and tangibly recognize, boy, there's something really different about that person. They might not recognize exactly what it is at first, but our lives should point people to Jesus Christ. If we truly immerse ourselves in the presence of God, if we are really seeking to be in tune with His Spirit and to be filled with His Spirit, Paul tells us that the glory that was seen in Moses' face, it it diminished over time. But for us, well, it's a bit different. I want to have you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I would encourage you, I'm going to, kind of quickly go through this passage. But I would encourage you later today, later this week, continue to read through 2 Corinthians 3 and even chapter 4. And really consider God's presence and God's glory and how it's revealed. I want you to listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting to verse 7. I I can't dive into all of this like I, I desire to. 
But I want you to study this this week. It says this, Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, he's talking about the Ten Commandments and the law. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which, is, which, was, beginning, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory Think about what Paul's trying to say here. He's like, listen. He's like, if the, if the ministry of, of what took place with the law and the commandments, you know, and Moses, they couldn't even look at his face. If that was so amazing, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Verse 9, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Paul's, he's not trying to downplay the law. He's not trying to downplay Moses in his experience. But he wants to show is how much greater the glory is that comes with the new covenant. The law brings death, but the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit and righteousness, brings life and even more glory. Verse 10 says this, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. The old compared to the new and what Christ brought with His death and His resurrection with salvation. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. You know, for the, for the Old Testament, for, for the people of Israel, for many, many Jewish uh, individuals today, they're all about um, keeping the law, right? Right? They're all about what they do. Uh, that, that was the Pharisees, right? They, they had it broken down into all these specific things that you could and could not do. And if you messed, well, I'm sorry, you, you screwed up. you got to go and offer sacrifice. They, they, they got super religious with it. Listen, our hope is not in keeping the law. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, and it's been sealed by His Holy Spirit. He goes on in verse 12 to say this. Since we have such a hope, it's a greater hope. Because of Christ, we have a greater hope. We are very bold. There's a greater boldness. That word bold has the idea of, of being audacious. Not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, right? Their hearts were hardened. Think about it. How many made it into the promised land? Joshua and Caleb. For to this day, when they, the, speaking of Jews and those really who don't know Christ, read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. They don't see it, they don't get it. Because only through Christ is it taken away. The only way you can understand eternity, the only way you can understand uh, heaven, the, the only way you can understand things that are going on in this world and in life, the only way you can comprehend things is with the veil to be lifted. And that's only through Christ. In fact, it goes on to say this in verse 15, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. For the Jew, for those who don't know Christ, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. That's a great spot for an amen. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Listen to verse 18. And we all, all who are followers of Christ, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, from glory to glory. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The more we are transformed, the more we become like the Savior. The more we become like Christ. The more that we grow in sanctification, the more we behold our God and His glory. The more we become like the one in whose image we were made. 
New American Commentary says this, we can never encounter God and remain unchanged. So it stopped right there. We can never encounter God and remain unchanged. Beholding this glory affects our transformation as we are changed into the likeness of our Savior. In 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, Paul calls man the image and glory of God. The fall tarnished that image and glory, but not irreparably. Now it is being restored. This transformation is brought about through Christ as the image into whom the believers are to grow. See, we reflect the God that we serve. We reflect Him, His glory, His light, His brightness. Roman, Romans chapter 1 makes it clear that God's Vis invisible attributes have been perceived since the creation of the world. And yet, the world has exchanged the glory of the Creator for the creation. That's exactly what's going on in our world. This is why the world reflects the God of self in sin. Because that's what our world worships. That's what people who are not followers of Christ worship. They worship self. They worship the things of this world. They indulge in sin. And when you indulge yourself in that kind of lifestyle, that's what you reflect. But when you, when you indulge yourself in the Lord and when you are mindful of His presence and when you are beholding our great God, you become more and more like Him. Piper says this, you become most like what you admire most. If you admire the glory of God most and all of His ways, you'll become more and more conformed to that. When we behold the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same degree, same image from one degree of glory to another, from degree to degree to degree to degree. And this ought to be so encouraging to us. It speaks to the awe and wonder of God and His glory and His character. The reality is you can continue and you can pursue God each and every day and you can seek each and every day to grow as much spiritually and as much in your relationship with God as you can humanly possibly do it. And you can do that for every day to the, for the rest of your life. And yet, you'll never fully understand God and His glory. And to me, that's amazing. I wouldn't want it any other way. I wouldn't want to worship a God that I can fully comprehend in my human mind. I love the fact that we worship and we serve God who is so other, who is so amazing. So we have the cross as followers of Christ to pay for our truth-suppressing um, unrighteousness but with salvation comes new birth. Heart of stone is taken out. Blindness is removed. The Spirit is indwelling inside of us. And then for the rest of our lives, we beholding the glory of the Lord. We're being changed from one degree of glory to the next. So that week by week, and day by day, as we dive into God's Word, as we're mindful of His presence, as we allow His Spirit to encourage and challenge and convict us in our lives, we are growing more and more and more, and we are being transformed and changed from one degree of glory to another. I, I want to challenge you. If you really, uh, you really want to see God, you want to see God, you want to grab a hold of His glory, read God's Word. Allow it. Allow it to transform your thinking. Study it. 
read it. As I looked at this passage, honestly, I thought to myself, I, I, I can't adequately preach this to you today because of how incredible our great God is. So as we close, I just want to read that verse, that last verse, verse 18 from 2 Corinthians 3 to you again. And I encourage you to listen to this encouraging word. And we all, with unveiled face as followers of Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Church, He's given us this great gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We tend to read these passages in Exodus 33 and 34, and, and, it, and we do. We struggle to wrap our minds around what that was like. But at the same time, don't diminish the reality that God's Spirit resides within you if you're a follower of Christ. And that we have His Word. And that as we allow His Spirit and His Word to transform Form us, we continue to grow, and we are being changed from one degree of glory to another. Praise God for that. As you go from here, as you go from this place today, as you go throughout this week, be mindful of God's presence. Whatever you have going on, be mindful of His presence. That He is there that He is with us, and that He is for us. God, we come before You today overwhelmed by Your presence and Your glory. I'm not sure, Lord, that we really fully grasp it. And that just speaks to how amazing You are. But Lord, we thank You as we go through this. We thank You for how You transform us. That we're more and more like you, more and more like, son, like your son. We're thankful to be created in the image of our God. And we're thankful that you transform us from one degree of glory to another continually as we grow in you. God, that's our desire. And as we hear about your presence in your glory, it ought to cause us to be in wonder of you. It ought to cause us to want to pursue and behold you, our God and our King, more than anything else in this life. To behold your presence. So God, help us to do that. Help us to not get caught up in the things of this world, in this life. Things that are considered good. For we want to pursue that which is great, and that is you. God, work in us, we pray, and we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. To close our time this morning, the praise team is going to sing a song for you this morning that comes from Exodus chapter 33, and it kind of retells the story of Moses' um, opportunity to go up on the mountain and to have this request before God, please, God, show me your glory.
down 